Do you sweat? That's is heavy. It, does this look like it's hot? Yeah. It's it's actually like pretty cool. It's, it, does it it's wick? It's loose. There's not a lot of sweat to wick. <laughs> I read a thing about sociopaths not regulating heat properly. And it's really freaked me out because I wear parkas in the summer and... Well, I don't think you're a sociopath. I read the same thing about people who like black coffee. Oh, no. It had me wondering as well. So I've got two strikes against me. You like me. black coffee? Yeah. I think all that stuff is ridiculous. It's Wait, don't be. we have enough to worry about? <laughs> so I wonder, it seems like every time I talk to you, we're talking about something just random that the band got to do, right? We talked on Zoom a couple years ago about you being in the Rose Parade. I was looking up, because you, you live in Portland, I thought, I wonder if you guys had thrown out the first pitch or something at a Portland Pickles game. And it turns out there was Portugal the Man night at the Portland Pickles. Yo. Were, you, were you there? <laughs> Because there wasn't yeah. a lot of detail. Yeah. So we go to Pickles games as much as we possibly can. Oh, great. It's funny. Our tour manager, Ian, does not do anything. He doesn't leave his house if he doesn't have to. He is at every Pickles game. Season ticket holder. Yeah. So so we're always at Pickles games. Uh, such a fun team. Such a fun... Like, our daughter, Frances, loves going out to the Pickles games. That's awesome. And just a, a, the sickest crew, man. What did your night at the ballpark entail? Well, we had a hot dog. No, I mean, did you throw out the first pitch? Oh, yeah, pitch we or? threw the pitch. Yeah. Okay, Are you did kidding? you get it over? We all threw the pitch at the same time, <laughs> it, which is very Portland Pickles. All of us threw at the same time. Frances threw with us, and she was just so psyched seeing Dylan down, <laughs> down there ready to catch the ball. She ran over for a big hug afterwards, and Tank Dog tackled him. Which ruined Francis's hug, but it, it made Tank the Dog night. Tank Dog is the mascot? Tank Dog's our mascot. Oh, your mascot. Our right. mascot and Dylan. D Dylan, for some reason, they they weren't meshing that night. Yeah. They're just button heads Something about constantly. mascots. I think it's the dog thing. You know, it yeah. gets jealous. It sees <laughs> somebody new coming into the world. They're like, who who is this pickle that our Francis is hugging? Well, that is awesome that you had your own night. I feel like... That's career defining right there. Are you kidding? Recognized at a Pickles game? Do you know they're playing that night? Could you explain this to me? The Dub C Fish Sticks? The Fish Sticks? <laughs> yeah. Dub C, I don't even know what that is. The Dub C Fish Sticks. The Fish Sticks. I think this is kind of like a trend. Well, it's like the Macon Bacon. Yeah, yeah. So we have a lot of these, the b bananas, what is this, right. Savannah bananas, right. <laughs> that just keeps, because of the pickles, like, my feet is just slammed with, like, all you watch is pickles and bananas. It's great. Uh, well, it's easier to sell the merch if you've got, if you're the fish sticks. It, it's great merch. What's crazy, I got there early, Yeah. and one of the fish sticks, they needed their phone charged, and I helped them out. Wow. I sat there with my truck, let them charge his phone, went out. Then I just shouted at him the entire game. <laughs> are, you, are you a heckler at the ball oh, game? Oh, yeah. And Frances, our daughter, is her mom's British, so she's just got that, like, British footballer, like, hooligan oh, yeah. attitude. She is – you take her to Blazers games, and she's screaming the entire time because it's, it, basketball is so fast-paced. Right. You see that, like – yeah, that British sports fan comes out, and she's like, yeah, no. Does she pick a guy out on the other team and just ride him the whole game? Oh, she will. I mean, she, <laughs> she, she shouts out numbers, you know. Yeah. Hey, 42, get off my guy. <laughs> Go Call on. a foul there, Zebra. Yeah, yeah. NCAA wants you. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'm glad you could enjoy that. That's a good family night out, screaming at people. Get out all that, all those feelings. Well, congratulations on the new album, Chris Black Changed My Life. I know you've been asked about this a lot, but I think it's important because there is a reason why the album is called that. Yeah, so Chris Black was, I, I get, everybody called him like our, our hype man, and he, t he totally was. He was like our biggest supporter and fan, and, and just, he was really just one of our best friends. Like, this dude made you laugh constantly, and how he fell into this role of hype man is, he was just our friend who had really great taste in music. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why we listen to good DJs. This is why we, we listen to people. It's, I love somebody who can curate a great playlist, who can, who can t give you some new music to listen to, can kind of direct you towards the taste, you know? Chris had that. 
And we would take him around. Whenever we did corporate events, we'd say, hey, do you have a budget for a DJ? <laughs> and you'd bring Chris. <laughs> it's just an excuse to hang out with Chris. <laughs> So at one of these shows, Chris Chris is back there DJing. He's on stage with us. He has a microphone, wireless mic in front of him. Finishes his DJ set. We get up. He doesn't leave the stage, which is very Chris. He's just a kind of a joker. Yeah. He started picking up the mic in between songs, and he'd go, oh, my God, I can't believe it. And this is like a corporate event we're at, and he's just, like, hyping everybody up. He's like, let's let's do shots. Like, <laughs> This is the best thing I've ever seen. Can you hear that guitar? It was like Phil Anselmo on stage, like, hyping up Dimebag. Like, yeah, yeah, he yeah. was just, like, giving it to us, and we were all just laughing and having the best time. So we... You just couldn't do it without him. He came on tour with us. It's Bez and the Happy Mondays. You know, it's it's yes. it, that's what it is. It's yes. like our friend is just out there dancing and having a blast, and you get to enjoy this time with him. And sadly, he passed in 2019. And when he passed, we just we lost this person who had actually like turned around so many things in the group for us. You know, he had repaired really. Yeah, dude, we we ride on a bus. We sleep on bunk beds across from each other. Whatever's happening yesterday is happening today. Like it just happens the second you get out of your bunk, you run into each other, and there's no separation. It's it, it's family, but it's there's also like struggles. Chris brought that life back into the band. That was so fun, and I just think about that dude every day. You know, I think about these people we have in our li- lives who kind of show us direction. And the whole point of the album is Chris Black changed the band's life. But there are people around us who have changed our lives. And I, I feel like people should be talking about them, post about them. I mean, th- that's the whole movement. Is it, Chris Black changed the band's life. Francis, my daughter, changed my life. Who changed your life? When you try to think back to how you connect with people for a moment, like maybe the day you met him, his day changed somehow, and you never cross paths. It just... It blows your mind. In retrospect, it's like, well, that person was meant to be in my life. But there are so many things that had to come together for that very moment. You know what I mean? And you think about your kids that way, too. I know I do. Yeah. Every You happen to be the one yeah. that came to me. Yeah. And, and I mean, I don't really believe in much uh, in, in general. I believe that that kid found us. And I feel really lucky to have, have her. I feel lucky to have these people that... Our tour manager, Ian, he's been with us since 2006. He jumped in our van and just wanted to ride home. He was in San Diego and he said, can I get a lift from you guys? So we we picked this dude up, Ian Shaw, he's riding back to Portland with us. And first of all, (laughs) we're idiots. Like we have no idea how to do anything. (laughs) He looks on the floor of our van and we had all of our guarantees, which is not a lot of money. I mean, there's like ones and fives and tens in between the seats on the floor of the van. And he goes, what happens with this money? Do you just throw it down here and just grab it for gas money? He's like, I think you have to save receipts. And Ian just started doing all this stuff for us along the way. And it just, by chance, he was in San Diego and he's been with us since then. And I I think that's a really amazing person in our lives as well that just thought it was so funny that these idiots are just driving around with every dollar they've ever made sitting in between the two seats of their van. Well, yeah, I mean, if you account for that stuff, you might be able to write it off or something. Write it off? I don't even think we had we made enough to get taxed <laughs> the first few years. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good point. Well, I know your daughter is on the record. She sings on a couple of the songs. I'm wondering, is was this her idea? Was this your idea? Was this just sort of something, hey, you're sing? Uh, that's her idea. Yeah. It, it just always is. Like, she she is an improv artist. Yeah. And I, I find it really fascinating because I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but she has a neurodevelopmental, neurodegenerative disease. She has a lot of, like, learning delays. But when it comes to music, that kid just, she is, like, an extreme extrovert, and she is riffing on lyrics and melodies all day long. So she's writing her own words for things. I remember when she heard Ghost Town uh, off of Chris Black Changed My Life, she heard this song and she started doing these, it's coming soon, and she was like howling soon. 
and it became a part of the song. Yeah. And then she jumped into the studio like after we recorded it, and she just starts doing these howls and these whoops in the in the bridge of the song. And it was so cool. Only a kid steps in with that kind of energy and is like, the song is called Ghost Town. I want to hear some howls and some whoops. Like I want it to be a Halloween song. <laughs> That is great. And, you know, they talk a lot about uh, elderly people who have dementia, Alzheimer's. The, the one part of their brain that still works, even at the end, is music. You play them a song from 60 years ago and they can sing along with it. It's like that, that tells you how important that part of our brain and our soul is. We attach ourselves to music unlike anything else. I mean, I see it in her. I see the way she handles this stuff. And that's, I mean, just, that's essentially what she has right now. That's that's what her disease is. It's it's essentially dementia and Alzheimer's, like neurodegenerative disease. And it's really rare too, right? It's, it's super rare. So there's her specific uh, mutation. She's one of six. There's about 70 in the world with That's... DHCDS. We've connected with some of those families. Uh -huh. And it's been really, Van Zoe, uh, Francis's mom, and Mel, this other family in, in England have been doing such amazing work, just understanding the disease, kind of helping get the word out there and fundraising and how can we help? We have a fundraiser set up uh, at FrancisChangeMyLife.com. You can find it through ChrisBlackChangeMyLife.com and PortugalTheMan.com. Like you can find it. Her name is Francis. What we're doing is we're just trying to raise awareness for genetic testing. Mm -hmm. Get genetic testing done. Like it's it's accessible now. A anybody can do it. It's good to know if there's something that you can do to preventative measures. Maybe there's a treatment for something that you didn't know you had. Yeah, we're just trying to further the science. I mean, we're really trying to lower the cost for families in the future because the more the more money that goes to this research, the more money that goes to towards trying drug repurposing and just general studies. How far along are they in understanding exactly what this is? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get Francis to, I mean, I, I'm not trying to get too heavy and, uh, and everything, but to survive the next five, 10 years. You mm -hmm. know, we're trying to slow it down. I and mean, that's that's what we need to do is we need to use all the science that we can to try and slow down the progression of this disease. Because you can't cure it until you slow it down. And I think that's a, like a, a lot of Alzheimer's medications too are, you know, they, they go toward at least extending life and, and making quality of life better. Yeah. But ultimately, someday they're going to figure this out. But in order to get there, you know, the research has to be there, you know. Yeah, I think they're like five, five to ten years out on a lot of just treatments. So try to slow it down. I mean, this kid is so funny and she's so fun, like comes out on stage with us and just, man, she has been out with us, comes out and just waves to people in the crowd and is going I see you I see you and it feels like you're at a hardcore show it's the only way I can describe it mm -hmm. I see you I hear you you know I'm one of you and she's just she's like this really just special bright light and I see it in all these kids. I see it in the other kids around the other families. Well, it sounds like she has a spirit and a bravery that you probably pull from a lot. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully we'll have some good news, you know? I mean... I mean, I, we're so optimistic. Good. We're, we're just... We just go back home and go, let's go play. Let's go do all the fun stuff. It's urgent, you know? Like, it is time sensitive because it... it just the nature of these diseases so i mean we're moving as fast as we can and keeping it as fun as possible yeah you've spent some time with her up in alaska which is a great place <laughs> yeah spending more time up there now uh yeah actually we have been spending a lot of time in alaska i really have been looking for an excuse to to go back home and start playing some shows i think we're gonna do like 
a little residency thing and just hang out for a week this year. I think that's a beautiful idea. You know, it's got, I've been up there for one week in my life and I drove around and went camping. It's so big, <laughs> you know, it, it would be hard to do a tour of Alaska because you'd spend a lot of time driving. I don't think people really realize how freaking big that state is. It's, <laughs> it is so beautiful. Dude, I had somebody in the band say to me the other day, a guy, I'm really exposing them, I won't say their name, but they go, how big is Alaska? <laughs> is it like the size of Texas? <laughs> and I was looking at it, I'm like, I guess I grew up there, and maybe you don't know, but it's about the, a third of the United States. Right. And with a population of Rhode Island. Right. You know, or Fresno. Like, it, yeah. it is a massive, massive amount of land. And nobody lives And half there. the people live in one city. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the other half don't. If you could do it, would you have the skills to be a subsistence resident of, Ala of Alaska? A resident of Alaska, build your own cabin in the middle of nowhere and live off the land. Would you have the skills to do that? Well, would the Gorleys have the skills to do it? For sure. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not going to downplay what, what it is out there. Like, I don't think most Alaskans could do it. My cousin lived in Anchorage. He married into an Alaskan family. When he retired, he, he told his wife, I'm going to go live out in the bush. He built two huge diesel generators on this lake and an A-frame. When he'd run out of diesel in one, he'd switch over to the other, and he was out there six months a year. Yeah, that's how, how our family grew up. Like yeah. We grew up with generators, and that's what I'm saying. Like, Yeah, I remember how to do a lot of that stuff, but cool. I think people take for granted like how easy things are within the city and oh. how easy it is when you go to Home Depot and get what right. you need. Right. I mean, you're taking a tarp. A five five gallon tub of jelly out to the woods going okay I guess I got what I need for the next six months yeah well I remember here in this radio station in the middle of nowhere when I was up there and they would have this feature every day where the guy would get on and read messages that people were leaving for each other because that was the only way they could communicate hey Bob you need to drop off a case of beer and some whatever you know toilet paper at the the village store and i'll be by on thursday to pick it up hey thanks and that was like for an hour they're reading all because the people out in the bush that's yeah. how they communicated it's crazy alaska is a beautiful place community is the most important thing absolutely I mean, people talk a lot about what we do as as far as like outside of the outside of music and even within within music i mean that People say like what we do is political and it's not, it's community based. Like we care about people in our communities more than anything. Like it's always social issues. Yeah, sure. Like it crosses over into politics, I guess, when you go to the cities, but out in the villages, it's about toilet paper. <laughs> Dude, right. Can you drop it off and I will pick it up? You know, that's, that's how it is. When I was back home last, it had just been dumping snow and you're always gonna come across somebody in the ditch and you're always gonna stop and help them out. There's no time that when you see somebody alone in the ditch that you do not stop. Alaskans stop every time and that's what we continue to do in this band. I blew a tire on Highway 8 that week that I was up there. Is that paved now? <laughs> you hear that you dirt know? road that goes across? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, I wonder if it is paved. They've been paving a lot of those roads, but dude, it's permafrost. It was 150 miles of dirt road, and I blew a tire at the very end of it, just before I got back to like one between Anchorage and Fairbanks. And I discovered my rental car was missing an important part of the jack, and my cousin had given me a clam shovel. So I managed to sort of get it up <laughs> off the ground, and I had, with a clam shovel, I had to dig out my tire and get it off, put the little spare on, and then the next morning I went up to the only tire place I could find and they wouldn't take a credit card. So I had to drive all the way to Fairbanks and the whole time I'm going, oh man, oh man, I can't lose another tire. But Fairbanks was, was pretty. I was planning on going up there anyway. Yeah, I lived up there for a, a long time, like three, three years. I mean, outside the city pretty far, but yeah. I always loved it. It's so cold in the winter. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's one thing I miss and I can't say that my uh, Portland family misses it, but uh, yeah, I love a brutal winter. <laughs> like, uh, absolutely brutal. Like, snow me in. Like, 
Okay, I'm stuck. 24 hours of darkness is fine with you. Power out. Yeah. Go to the wood stove. Oh, I'm into it, man. I got to go back. It's so pretty. I just, like, astounding. I still think about it all the time. It's beautiful, and it's easier to get to than you think. Yeah. Even I forget how easy it is to get to Alaska. I mean, we take all these trips. Like, it took us five hours, six hours to get out here. Probably seven hours travel. Yeah. I mean, I could get back home for four hours yeah. from, from Portland. Sure. Yeah. Just hop on an Alaska <laughs> Airlines flight. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're there in no time. It was great to chat about Alaska, about your daughter, and how wonderful and beautiful she is. I didn't even get a chance to ask you about Edgar Winter. Oh, Edgar Winter, my favorite person. How did you get him on the record? There's a song called Champ on the new album, Chris Black Changed My Life. I was just kind of writing. I mean, writing is just stream of consciousness. You don't know what you're writing about, whatever. It's just words that are leading into each other. I kept coming up and singing this dying to live Edgar Winter melody. And I would just get to the point of where the bridge would be, and I just kept singing that part. And I didn't really know why. I think in, in hindsight, looking at the song, it's kind of about our friendships. And people have stood by me through a, a lot of like hard times and a lot of tough, tough moments for everybody. And it just kept reminding me of that song, Dying to Live. You know, why are we, you know, why am I fighting to live? Right before we turned in the album, it was so close to turning in everything. Jeff Basker and I were sitting there and we go, we should just ask him <laughs> yeah. to do it. Yeah. And Edgar was so stoked, so awesome. He answered the phone, are you ready to rock? <laughs> and like screamed it into the phone. I was like, wow, dude. <laughs> that, that is exactly what- 76 years old. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I want to hear. He was like, you know, I noticed he had this, I had this hardcore sample in there of this band With War from Portland, indigenous hardcore group. And he says, I noticed there's like a hardcore part on the on the song. Can I play synthesizer on that? Nice. I was like, hell yeah, dude. <laughs> so Edgar plays the synthesizer on that. And then he starts like kind of spacing out towards the end of the song. I mean, you'll hear all of this if you listen to it. Starts tripping out on it. And then he brings the sax back in. He's playing saxophone on it as well. Yeah. Which... Jesus, man! Like that—that's a good sax player. He is an incredible did, sax I, player. I didn't really think of him that way, dude. Yeah. I just want to make music with Edgar Winter. Yeah, like, where, there you where's go. my Edgar Winter band moment? Yo, yo, I need to get me Paul Williams. We'll get Edgar Winter on sax. Bring out Ringo on drums. Yeah, yo, I think we might be rebuilding. Like this is this is a good idea. Paul Williams, famous film composer. How oh. did that happen? Dude, this is years, years ago. We were doing a Music Cares. It was like a Fleetwood Mac tribute. We did a Lindsey Buckingham song. I don't think he liked our version of it. He <laughs> didn't say a word to us the whole time. So whatever, Lindsey. Get get over yourself. <laughs> we played this thing, and as we were walking backstage, like there's all these bands that are doing it. It's like crazy celebrity moment. Kyle comes up to us after we get backstage he goes oh my god i just met paul williams we've all been massive paul williams fans during the recording of censored colors our, th our third album all we had in the bedroom that we slept in we had one bedroom we all slept on the floor together and we watched phantom of the paradise every single day and we would listen to paul williams so much of that album is fueled by paul mm -hmm. this random meeting with paul I, po I posted about it and he immediately DMs us and he goes, hey, would you like to do some writing? We're like, oh my God, Paul Williams wants to do wow. some writing. <laughs> <laughs> and we just can't believe it. This dude is just is so generous. He's, he says, you know what? Let me come up to Portland. You don't have to come to LA. Wow. Like, come up, let me come up to Portland. He comes up for three days. Man, we had the, the best three days of writing and at the end we're having dinner and he goes let's be honest guys the only reason you have me here is because i'm the president of ascap and we go you're the president of ascap and and he just starts laughing he goes oh my god you guys are such idiots my name is on the check he helps <laughs> artists get paid and we were just such massive paul fans and i guess it was just the way to start off that friendship yeah. is like i know paul williams i don't know Paul Williams, I president that was of Ascap, or something. <laughs> yeah, so Paul is out there constantly fighting for writers' rights, and I, I gotta say, like, I appreciate that that dude so much more having met him. 
already a superstar in our lives before meeting him. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, you're a champion for all of us. Yeah. You, you are leading the charge in Congress and lobbying for artists. And I think it is, it's so beautiful having him and sharing this space with him on the album. The end of the, the, the album on Anxiety Clarity, there's Paul Williams speaking at the very end of the, of the record. And he's literally just talking to me in the studio about anxiety. We're, we're writing. That's how poetic he is. Like this dude wow. cannot help but but give you just gold. See, I think that was my favorite song of the record. And it gives me like a whole different perspective on that is that it's just a conversation. Yeah, it sounds really heavy. It sounds like it's a sample from something. Like yeah. It was something written. That was Paul. That's the way Paul talks. Yeah. You know, he's like bopping out some melodies, some lyrics here and there. And he goes, what's the song about? And I go, oh, well, it's it's about these anxieties. You know, like I have a, I, a lot of insecurities. Like I'm, I have a lot of anxiety on stage, anxiety in the world. And we're just talking about it. And he says, you know, everybody's scared. And he starts t talking to me about how it's like there's this forest fire and it's coming over the hill and we're all consumed by it. We're all just like, oh, this is so beautiful. It's, it's biblical. It's cinematic. You know, don't get too caught up in that because it will consume you. It will sweep through me, you know, and he just... See, I really thought that that was a spoken word piece from, like, from a speech or something. Yeah, it's how, it's how he talks and, and why I have to say, like, one of the most beautiful, magical people I've ever met in my life is Paul Williams. Paul is actually, like, a big reason... Uh, I've been doing any of this stuff. I mean, Paul and Francis. Like, I usually don't do a, a ton of press. I Like, I have a hard time getting in front of people and talking about my life and talking about these things. But it was really like Paul kind of pushing me and saying, like, you need to go out there and you need to be you. And I really appreciate him. I really appreciate those people in my life, much like Chris. I mean, all of these people change our lives. And yeah, again, I just want to see people talk about those folks in their lives. I see. I feel like we've covered a lot of ground. We went from the Portland Pickles, Portugal, the man night to Paul Williams. I mean, we've, we've talked about your daughter and what a beautiful human she is and, and all that. I think we've covered a lot of good ground here today. I feel good. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad I made you feel good. Do you want to keep this? I do want to keep that. Take it. I can take it. Look at this. It's a big pocket I can put it in. <laughs> <laughs>